Today I'm going to show you how to properly fill out the sample siting plan for a coffee shop that has its own groundwater well and UV treatment. The coffee house, like many restaurants with their own well, is considered a transient, non-community water system. This type of system has traditionally collected one coliform sample per quarter, but will now be collecting one sample per month under the new rule requirements. In fact, all systems will be sampling monthly now. Now, let's get to creating a sample siting plan for the coffee shop, which is called Jeff's Java House. First, it's a good idea to gather a few things together. I have a plumbing diagram of the Java House. I also know the population served and the PWS ID number. I also know where the current coliform samples are collected. The sample siting plan form is available on the RTCR website, which links to the DEP e-library. When you go to the site, you'll notice four different sample siting plan forms. We are covering Form 1 in this tutorial, which is for non-community systems collecting one routine sample per month. The web link for the RTCR website containing all the forms is shown on screen. So let's dive into the form. So I've opened the form in Microsoft Word. This is a two and a half page form. You can also open it as a PDF right from the DEP website. You could print it and fill it out by hand if you'd like. This Microsoft Word version was created with form fields, so the only place you can make changes is within the gray areas and the check boxes. Everything else is locked down. I'll show you this by entering the date in the top left for date plan updated. If I click up here in the title, the cursor goes straight to the date plan updated field. The first part of the form is called general system information. I'll begin filling in the information for Jeff's Java House. This system is completely fictional for the purposes of showing you an example, so I'll quick put in the name, PWSID, and the mailing address. Now it's crucial to fill in that PWSID number. You should be able to get that from your permit. Next, I fill in the contact name for the system. In the case of Jeff's Java House, the business owner is the contact, and his name is Jeff Owning. So let me type that in. For some bigger systems, the contact might be somebody else, like the head operator. Now let's go to population served. This is an important number because it dictates how many coliform samples you have to collect each month. For a transient system, like our example, the system population is the average daily number of customers and employees. The Java house has an average of about 100 customers per day and a couple of employees. So I'll average it to 100 and put that in here. Below population is a checkbox asking if you are seasonal or not. Seasonal systems have a season begin date and end date that they enter in the form. The Java house is open all year round, so I check no. You can see all I have to do is click in the box and an X appears. Now the next area of the form asks for source type. This business is on its own well, so I'll check groundwater. The next part asks for disinfection treatment used. The Java House system has a UV light only, so I'll check this in the form. If you have some type of chlorinator, you would check the box for chlorine. The next part asks, was the distribution map or plumbing diagram reviewed when developing the sample siting plan? If you remember in the beginning, I said I had my plumbing diagram ready, so I'll check yes here, and you'll see in a minute how we use it to complete the plan. Now in the next box, I'll fill in the name of the lab that collects the coliform samples for the Java house. It is Clean Laboratories. Now the last two rows on this table ask for the responsible official information. Jeff is the owner of the business, so that makes him the responsible official. Once I print the form, we'll have Jeff sign it at the bottom. Now take a look at the question at the bottom of page one. It asks if you collect more than one routine sample per month. Some non-community systems, especially those with seasonal fluctuations, might need to collect two or more samples per month. For a transient system, this happens when your average daily population goes over 1,000 persons. So if you have any questions on this, please call your DEP inspector, otherwise known as a sanitarian. And if this is the case, you are steered to Form 3 instead of this Form 1 that we're using. Let's look at page 2 of the form. 
part two on page two asks for sampling information. It starts with this table for sample locations. So this means we have to think about where we are going to sample for coliforms. To help with this, let's look at the plumbing diagram for the Java house. Sampling must be representative. With such a small system, just about every sampling area is representative of water throughout the system. There aren't areas of stagnant water since each location gets a good amount of use. The kitchen sink represents a location that is used the most for making the drinks and the food items that are served at the cafe. The system has used this as the coliform sampling location and it makes sense to continue with this under the revised rule. After a coliform positive, three check samples are required. These locations have to be identified in the sample siting plan. One of the check samples is always the routine location, so the kitchen sink for the Java house. According to the regulation, one check sample should be collected at a tap within five service connections upstream and one within five connections downstream. Well, in the case of a single connection building like the Java house, you simply identify locations that are on either side of the routine location. In our case, we have two bathrooms, one in the kitchen area and one in the dining area. So we'll identify these as our check sample locations. Now let's go back to the form. On the form, this table asks for site location information. I'm going to skip the first column for now. In the second, the idea is to put down your routine location first, followed by the two check samples. Remember, the routine location is also a check sample location. I'll type our routine location, which is the kitchen sink, and the two check sample locations in the next two rows. In the third column called sample type, you can see that D for distribution and C for check are already coded into the table. In the last column, you can see that it asks if site accessibility is limited. In other words, will whomever is sampling have trouble accessing any of the sites, such as the case when check samples are required, but your business is closed for the day. So because the Java house is not open 24 seven, the lab who does the sampling could have some accessibility issues. I'll check the boxes here for the check samples, and then I'll show you in a minute how we describe it. First, however, I skipped over the first column in this table. The first column asks for location ID used to identify the total coliform sampling site. According to the instructions for the form, this number must be between 700 and 999. I'll identify this here as 700. You'll notice that it is one location ID for the routine sample and the two check samples. By doing this, the check samples are tied properly to the routine sample. It's really something that affects the DEP data system. Let's go down to section B, which is the description of limited accessibility. If you remember, just a minute ago, I checked the boxes that site accessibility is limited for the check samples since the Java house isn't open 24 seven. In this portion of the form, we describe the limited access. To explain this, I'll say, Routine sampling will be planned during business hours. Check samples may need to be collected after hours. So sample collection will be coordinated with the owner. Section C is for the sample schedule. If you remember under the revised rule, all systems are going to monthly monitoring. To use this table, we are asked to fill in the sample location ID for each month. My only sample location is number 700, so I'm going to put that here for each month. Some systems alternate between two different locations. If this is the case, I would put something like 700 for January and 701 for February, and then back to 700 for March, etc. Again, we just have 700 for each month since the Java house has just one routine location. Section D is the description of representative sampling. An important aspect of sampling is that it is representative of water in your system. In larger water systems, this means finding the worst case areas such as high water age or stagnant dead ends. Like I mentioned earlier, in a small facility like our Java house, we don't have problems with high water age or stagnant water. So I type this in as the explanation. 
This is a small facility with all the taps on one floor and in relatively close proximity to each other. The kitchen sink is the routine sampling location because it is the primary tap used for human consumption in making drinks and baking. Section E is the sample interval description. It is important that your sampling is spaced consistently. In other words, you'll be sampling once per month, so don't sample in the first week of one month and then the last week of the next month. For the Java House, we've determined that they'll sample during the second week of each month, so we've written that here. There is just one more part, and it's a short one. Part 3 is called Source Water Monitoring. All the community systems in Pennsylvania are required to provide something called four log treatment of viruses. This is a certain level of disinfection. For a lot of you viewing this and including the Java House in our example, you are not required to provide four log treatment of viruses. So, this means if you have a total coliform positive at your routine site, you're required to collect a raw water sample at your source for coliforms. I'm showing you this on the plumbing diagram. Going back to the form, for the Java house, I've listed the source ID and the description of where the raw water tap is in the basement. Once you have completed the form, it should be signed and submitted to your local DEP office. The Form 1 instructions contain a list of local DEP offices organized by county. The instructions are available along with the form at the RTCR website shown at the bottom of the screen. You can drop off the completed form or mail it, attention to the Safe Drinking Water program. If you have questions about filling out the form or sending it to DEP, you can call your DEP sanitarian. Your sanitarian may allow you to email a copy of the completed form to DEP rather than using regular mail. If you do not know your sanitarian, use the office list in the form instructions to call DEP. Thank you for viewing this tutorial, and please visit the RTCR website for the most recent information.